I say 3.30, the auditor's responses to assessed risks. I come down to my requirements. I've got overall responses, so where I need to find responses to the risk at the financial statement level. And then I've got audit procedure responsive to assessed risks of material misstatements at the assertion level. For both of those, I've got application paragraphs to assist me. So we'll start with five. Overall responses, if we're looking for overall responses to the assessed risks at a financial statement level, A1 is going to help me. Overall responses to the risks at the financial statement level may include emphasizing that they need to maintain professional skepticism, assigning more experienced staff or those with special skills or experts, more supervision, incorporating an element of unpredictability and then making general changes to the nature, time and extent of the audit procedures. So if we've got a risk at the financial statement level that the control environment is weak, the general changes to the nature, time and extent of my audit procedures are going to be to follow a substantive approach instead of a combined approach because I don't want to test the controls if the control environment is weak. Okay, just a little bit further on that. Deficiencies in the control environment, I might want to do more audit procedures at period end, more substantive procedures, and maybe I want to increase the number of locations to be included in the audit scope. Order procedures responsive to the assessed risks of material misstatement at the assertion level. We have to design and perform further audit procedures whose nature, timing and extent are responsive to those risks. Paragraph A4 to A8 is going to give us some help there. And A4 says you've got to determine the audit approach. Is it going to be only test of controls? or substantive procedures or a combination of the two. But it's important to note here that you have to perform substantive procedures for a material class transaction account balance or disclosure. And so guys, in your case, you will be developing an audit plan for a material class of transaction account balance or disclosure. Because remember, we are not going to audit things that we do not believe could have a risk of being materially misstated. So for you guys, you would choose between a substantive and a combined. Then it says you will have to determine the nature, the purpose, test of control or substantive and its type, how it's going to be performed. The timing, when it's going to be performed and the extent, quantity to be performed. Then in designing the further order procedures, you have to consider the risks, the likelihood of the material misstatement due to its characteristics, so the inherent risk, and then the assessment of the controls, so the control risk and obtain more pervasive audit evidence, the higher the auditor's assessment of risk. Let's go to A9 to A18. The nature. The auditor's assessed risk may affect both types of audit procedures that are going to be performed. And then they give you some examples. So, in relation to revenue, Test of controls may be more responsive to the assessed risk of completeness, where substantive procedures may be more responsive to the risk for the occurrence assertion. The reason for your assessment. If the assessed risk is lower, then you may determine that you're going to do analytical procedures as opposed to test of detail. The timing, interim or year end. But if you do interim, you have to do year end too. So it's interim and year end or period end only. The higher the risks, the more you want to do the substantive procedures nearer to or at period end and or at unpredictable times. 
On the other hand, if you'd perform them during, at an interim stage, you might be able to identify significant matters and then consequently have them resolved by year end. So there's just justification for going with either. Certain procedures can only be performed after year end, like agreeing the financials to the accounting records, auditing adjustments, and procedures to respond to the risk that they've entered into improper sales contracts or transactions that may not have been finalized or post-reporting date events. Then, further relevant factors to influence when, control environment, when information is available, the nature of the risks, extent, you have to determine after considering materiality and then for example, in response to assessed risk of material misstatement due to fraud, you will increase your sample sizes, doing more detailed procedure. But also they say, note, if they have a computer information system, you can use CATS. That, guys, you could put under extent or you could put under nature. So that's a summary of your audit plan. You're going to have to determine your approach. You're going to have to discuss the nature, the timing, and the extent. And there's some guidance there. But then, to get into the detail of each, the standard splits it between if you are going to do test of controls and if you are going to do substantive. So remember, if you've chosen the combined approach, then both of these are going to be relevant. So your test of controls, we can only perform them if there's an expectation that the controls are going to operate effectively or if substantive procedures alone cannot provide sufficient appropriate audit evidence. So guys, we've already discussed that when we looked at ISA 315. It is if they have a computer information system and there is no ability to get access to test substantively or if there's a lack of an audit trail so you can't test substantively. So let's go and look at A20 to A24. So just to note here, testing the operating effectiveness is different from getting an understanding, although you might actually use the same procedures, but you'll probably then have a bigger sample size rather than just looking at one as a walkthrough. Some risk assessment procedures may provide evidence over the effectiveness of the controls and then you can use them. And then this is the one, in some cases, it's impossible to design substantive procedures that will provide sufficient audit evidence. This could happen if they are using IT and there's no documentation of the transactions. So then testing the controls within the system is going to give us the evidence we need because we can't actually go and test the detailed documents to make sure that the RAND figure is correct. But if the controls within the information system are working properly, then we can assume that the RAND amount is correct. So that's your justification for going with a combined approach and why you're going to test controls. In addition, just to note, you cannot only do inquiry, you are going to have to test how the control was performed, its consistency, and by whom. A29. Just a note on your RT, because the RT processing is consistent, an automated control can be expected to function consistently unless the program is changed. So you would only need to test that once as opposed to having a large sample. Other factors that affect the audit plan for your test of controls, the timing you have to conduct, test of controls throughout the period. So guys, whether you come in at an interim stage or whether you come only at year end. You have to test the control was functioning effectively from the beginning of the year all the way through to the end. So that's saying, if you come in at the interim stage, then you have to roll forward those procedures to year end, meaning you need to test the control between the interim date period and year end, as well as everything you've done up until interim. If you come in at year end, 
when you're selecting your sample, you need to select the sample from the beginning all the way through to year end to make sure that it worked consistently through the full year. Using audit evidence obtained at an interim stage, just to make sure that you can, but there mustn't be any changes subsequent to that interim period. Using audit evidence obtained in previous audits. So once again, you can, but you've got to make sure that internal control has been effective and understand if there were any risks arising from that control, that the general controls were effective if they had a computer information system. And then the most important part about that, there could not have been any changes and we have to have tested that control at least once in every third audit. So guys, this you could put under your nature or your extent because this is determining whether you want to do additional work this year or use prior year. Very important to note, however, that if it's a significant risk, you have to test the controls in the current period. You cannot use the rule above. Testing the operating effectiveness, you need to see whether the control is effective and if it is not then you will have to do substantive procedures. Nature. Now whether we've chosen a combined or a substantive approach, here's the details you put down for substantive. You have to do substantive procedures for a material class of transaction or account balance. A42 to 47. So determining the substantive procedures nature you could perform Analytical procedures provided they are supported by test of controls. If you want to just do substantive, then you will have to do test of detail or a combination of both. But what this is saying, you cannot only choose to do analytical procedures if you're doing a substantive approach. You can do analytical procedures if you're doing a combined approach because then you've got other evidence through your test of controls. So basically, analytical procedures alone is not sufficient. They need to either accompany substantive test of detail or test of controls. Why would you do them? They're generally more acceptable when there's a high volume of transactions. And so that's why generally when you're going a combined approach, you're going to say test of controls and more analytical, less test of detail. And then just to be aware, yeah, substantive procedures may be increased if the controls were unsatisfactory. As soon as we see the test of controls are not working, we, or as soon as we see our tests about the controls show the controls are not working, we need to do substantive procedures. We've got to increase our number. And then consider whether external confirmations are acceptable or required. And there's a whole bunch of examples in the standard. Your financial statement closing process in terms of your substantive procedures, reconciling the financial statements to the accounting records and examining journal entries. And then if there is a significant risk, just like with controls, we had to test those controls in the current year if it was a significant risk, that bypassed the previous rules. If it's a significant risk, you have to do substantive procedures. So if you are asked to develop an audit plan for an account balance or class of transaction that carries a significant risk you, and you want to test controls, you are going to go a combined approach. The timing of your substantive procedures, well, either you're going to come at a combination, interim and year end, or only at year end. And if there are any misstatements at an interim stage, you might have to adjust your order procedures to cover the remaining period. The auditor is then required to consider whether the presentation and disclosure of the financials is adequate, got to evaluate the sufficiency and the appropriateness of audit evidence, and I've just said go, go to A61. A61 says the auditor cannot assume 
An instance of fraud or error is an isolated occurrence. So, you cannot just say this happened once, I'm going to carry on. You've now got to stop and reconsider the control environment, management's integrity, and how that impacts on the audit going forward. And finally, there's documentation. You have to document your overall responses and your audit procedures, including the conclusions. And that is ISA 330. So let's go and try a question. Class example, you have got three minutes reading time and 15 minutes writing time. 